and get us started here. Chris, hit the record button for us. Chris Singer, thank you. Um, great, we've got the slides in the chat. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Whiteside and I'm the director of the Mid Valley STEM and CTE Hub. Before we get started, just a few notes to help the presentation run smoothly. If you haven't done so yet, please uh, set your screen to screener view up there in the right hand corner. Um, and we've got everyone's uh, uh, is muted. If you could also just disable your camera so we don't have to worry about the bandwidth there. Um, we'll turn those back on at the end for Q and A. Um, so we have the chat open. Please go ahead and put any questions that you have at any time during the presentation in the chat. We'll gather those up for some questions with Chris Woods at the end. Uh, we also have a short survey we're going to put in the chat. If you could please help us with feedback about the presentation. It's also your ticket to the giveaway for this presentation, which is uh, Chris's book. So be sure to fill that out and we'll put that in the chat for you. So with that, let's get started. I'm so excited to welcome you to our STEM Week presentation with Chris Woods. For those of you who don't know us, the Mid Valley STEM and CTE Hub works here in Lynn and Benton counties to enhance and elevate STEM and CTE opportunities for learners of all ages. We work with educators, students, families, business and industry and community organizations to bring folks together to solve problems, learn and have fun. Uh, we also get to work with amazing people like today's presenter. We are so fortunate to have Chris Woods with us today. Here's a little bit of information about him. He started Daily STEM to provide educators and families with simple STEM resources that connect the real world to learning. Our kids need to see that STEM is all around us, in the backyard, at the store, in our homes, on TV and movies, in the news, everywhere. Chris has been a high school math teacher, teaching Algebra 1, Algebra 2, hands-on geometry for over 20 years in Michigan. And he was named the Calumet Public Schools 2013 Teacher of the Year. With that, Chris, take it away. Hey, I'm so excited to, uh, to be here. I'm so glad that Sarah and Chris invited me uh, to Oregon. I know it's pronounced Oregon, even my, though uh, my shirt kind of uh, assumes it's Oregon. I know, but um, uh, you can you can all get mad at me later. My wife lived there for a year. She she told me that uh, apparently in in uh, Oregon you don't tan, you rust, uh, just with all of the uh, the moisture there. Uh, that, was, that was always kind of a fun one. Fun one. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that one before, but I am going to share my screen. And uh, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some slides going here so that you can follow along. The slide link is in the chat and some people I can tell have already uh, clicked and uh, are kind of gonna be following along at a, on a, a different spot. But again, that's more so because I'm gonna be sharing tons of ideas, tons of inspiration and ideas. Uh, you can always go back and find uh, the link to these slides on my website, dailystem.com slash speaking. You scroll down to where there's a bulleted list, you can find today's date and uh, the Oregon STEM week and you'll be able to find those slides anytime because because they're there to help you. They're there uh, to just encourage you. And uh, by the way, if you're on Zoom, if you've never uh, learned this before, you can actually uh, go up to the top for view options and you can you can do side by side mode. And uh, if you do that, you can um, do uh, you can uh, spread that out and you can change uh, your views so that it's uh, side by side speaker. And then you'll see me kind of as a bigger person and the slides next to me because I'm going to be active. I'm going to be talking. I want to, I want to get you uh, going. And, and some of you also, hopefully you want to check in the chat box or throw things in the chat box because uh, I know Chris will be watching it and I'll be watching it as well because I, I love uh, hearing and seeing the things that, uh, that you're thinking about as we go through this. And I know people are going to be jumping in and jumping out because it's lunchtime. So, uh, but I know, I know we're busy. Uh, but the first thing I would love to do, if anybody's got uh, the, uh, the ability uh, or the option, I would, I would love to have you put in the chat. Just tell me uh, who you are and uh, what, your, what your context is. What do, you, uh, what do you do in education right now? You teach in? I'm a, I'm a teacher. Uh, I work with kids every day. We're, I live in Michigan and um, we're a hybrid situation right now and we're just making the best of it, trying to help these kids as much as we can every day. But if you're if you're a specific context or working with a specific age group or specific type of classroom, 
Uh, I love that. Oh, Parma. All right. Great. Great to, uh, great to hear that, uh, Deb. Um, but that way I can, I can, if I, if I think of things that really connect or could really help one or more of you, I'll definitely try to throw those in as well. Nick and met you a little bit already earlier and Marcus after school educator, boys and girls clubs. That's awesome. Love that Marcus. There's some great things you can do with STEM uh, after school working uh, with kids. Um, Nick, uh, definitely math and STEAM six to eight. I, I love that. And dad, that's great. Yeah. Cause a lot of us first and foremost, uh, we are parents to our, to our own kids and we want to come up with some great ways to get them uh, doing STEM as well. Uh, Rinda is a post-secondary coordinator. Uh, so you're, you're doing some great stuff to help other educators. That's great. And, and again, so many people uh, are working uh, not only just right now, you're, you're kind of going to take some of these ideas and bring them back to some of your fellow teachers. And hopefully you can do that because that's how we're going to build a culture of STEM learning. Shay, uh, secondary teacher, child development. Love that. There's some great connections uh, for STEM and things and that. Robert, high school math and science. Small, oh, I started out teaching alternative school. Uh, love, love those kids. Um, great, uh, you, are, you are a superhero. All of you are superheroes too, by the way. Uh, I, I would mention uh, that as well. Uh, but we're gonna talk about how to build a culture of STEM. And I'm gonna give you inspiration and ideas because more than anything in a presentation, that's what we really need. We, need, we wanna be inspired to get back into our classroom and get extra excited. And, and then also, you know, keep that idea, all those ideas going. Some of the, some, I'm going to share a ton of ideas. I want this to be interactive, ask questions at any point in the future. If you got a question for me, always happy to help, dailystem at gmail.com, or you can go to dailystem.com, or find me at dailystem, especially on Twitter, some on Instagram and Facebook, but it's all daily STEM because that's what it should be, STEM every day. That's, that's what it's really all about, and I appreciate Chris tossing those in the chat box as well. First off question, why STEM? I mean, I think a lot of you are already understanding that STEM is so important. We know it's it's a buzzword. But we've got to take it past being just a buzzword. We've got to make it um, all everywhere. And, and, and me as a teacher, I'm trying to do that in my own classroom. I, I want to help my kids realize that being a nerd is an okay thing. I'm there to help and I'm trying to help and inspire those kids in my classroom every time. STEM is everywhere. The other day I was out playing disc golf with my son, found a bone, brought it home. I'm gonna take some pictures of it under my microscope and share it with my students and, and just see what we can learn from it. STEM is everywhere. We saw trash barrels when we were playing disc golf and they were filled with drink containers. And my mind is thinking, how could you do something different there? Could there be some recycling bins? Could there be something different to just to prevent all that from just going right in the trash? I see STEM when I'm out helping with a project. Like last weekend, I was helping a guy take off a roof uh, and put a new roof on and we're using the magnetic roller. So I'm snapping pictures of that so I can share that with my kids because that's a great simple example of magnetism and magnetics, uh, a simple prod a product that's been created to solve a problem, problem solving in real life. And that STEM is everywhere. And if we, if we don't have a lot of places to grow stuff outside, bring that in our classrooms. And I'll show you some of uh, this simple idea later on. This is, this is actually from my classroom this year. I could see the freeway, not even a block away uh, that from where I teach, uh, but my kids are growing stuff right in our classroom. And not only are they growing stuff, they are growing themselves. Uh, and it's really all about helping kids to, to see the world through STEM colored glasses. And I look at the world with those STEM colored glasses. And, and I think if you, if you start to notice all these STEM things around you and start bringing them into your classroom in whatever context you're in, like so many of you, you can do some incredible things to inspire your kids to be ready for any of those jobs, any of those futures that we talk about, those STEM careers, those STEM futures. Well, right now is the future. And if we start helping kids to see like that, and even just like yesterday, last night, my family and I went to a, um, an arcade, played some pinball, played some old school video games, and uh, had a good time. It was nice to be, kind of be out and about, do, do something fun um, together and um, out in the world a little bit. Um, but you know what? As I'm playing all those games, I'm imagining all the STEM that goes on to create those old school games like Dig Dug and um, uh, what was the other one I was playing? Uh, Millipede and Donkey Kong, old school Donkey Kong. But then also uh, just those old, old, old school pinball. And, and 
all of it has STEM. And if we start to help kids realize that even as the pandemic hit, all that six feet stuff, guess what? That was STEM kids. That was a great opportunity to teach about units. Uh, and, and as the pandemic hit and everybody was at home, instantly I said, let's make more ideas. And, and I had already made one of these kind of lists uh, and I just started making more ideas, more lists of, of things that parents and families and kids could do. Uh, and teachers, so many educators grabbed these lists and shared them with their students. Uh, these, these lists are all available on my website. So much stuff on my website for free, because um, that's what it's really all about. Just to try to give educators like you um, more ideas, spark more interest, and, and then sharing those ideas with others, because we can all learn uh, from, uh, from all those ideas as well. Um, but it's really all about taking us past just that idea of what a STEM class is. And, and I know a lot of you have STEM class at your school and some of you are STEM teachers and it's great. I love that. Some of you are doing once per week or five a week and then you're off for a few days and however you have it scheduled every day for a marking period, like an elective or, or maybe you don't have STEM class, but you have somebody that's a STEM coordinator in your school, whatever you're doing to help build uh, those kids some opportunities to do STEM, hopefully we more and more almost get to the point where we, where we work ourselves out of this, where, where we don't have an actual STEM class, but what we have is, is so many integrated electives that are combining all these curriculum ideas and combining all these subjects. And that's when STEM is truly going to be what STEM can really be for these kids. It's not a class we teach, it's a culture that you are building in your classroom and in your school and in your community. And so many of you are doing this already. Um, and again, as you, as you come across anything, if there's anything you're wondering about as we go through, uh, keep asking questions because I want to help build confidence. And so many people have asked me questions. Yeah, that's why I wrote the book. And, and Chris said, there's a, there's a, they're going to give away one. Uh, and I think there might even be a, um, a book study going on in the future uh, using it. But, but again, I only wrote it, uh, obviously not to get rich, I wrote it to help educators just to come up with those ideas to really see that idea. It's all about using the real world to get that world that's out there outside the window, look out the window right now, outside that window, there's STEM happening every day in every career, every job. And how do we bring that into our classroom to make our classroom more relevant and getting those kids to learn? That's what we can do. STEM has the power to get kids excited about learning, that creativity and curiosity aspect. But so many kids uh, lose that creativity and curiosity as they get older. And some of you are, are middle school, high school teachers. You, you know that's a tipping point, middle school and then high school. Some of them, they're just, they almost just get bored with it. But we can also build those soft skills of communication and confidence that kids need, especially right now when so many of them are behind a mask and, and just uh, not able to communicate a lot. Uh, I've noticed in my own students, it's really tough for them uh, to communicate, to have that confidence to speak up and share an idea, even if it's something that they're passionate about. But STEM can do that. It can also enhance what we're already doing uh, because it helps us to collaborate with other educators, especially as we uh, can, can come out of the pandemic and have more of those opportunities to do that and interact, uh, but also provides, again, for every kid, opportunities for the future. That's what I tell my kids almost every day. You've got opportunities today. Take advantage of these opportunities because they're going to provide you with all sorts of opportunities in the future. It's almost like you're getting more lottery tickets right now. You have more chances of winning. Um, I have a number of core STEM beliefs and we're gonna get into some, some questions I want you to discuss. And then I'm gonna throw a bunch of ideas, a bunch of resources that'll hopefully spark some ideas. And if you got more questions or looking for specific resources, uh, I'm also going to have you throw some of those in uh, as well. Uh, STEM is number one for every kid, every classroom, every day. Every kid should have the opportunity to do STEM. Every kid in every classroom, every day, we should, even if it's five minutes or, or five hours or five days, little big ways, whatever, we can have STEM happen in our classrooms every day. Every kid deserves that opportunity, no matter where they live. It's not just robots and rockets. That should not limit us. You know, it's great. I mean, I saw some, some tremendous... Um, and, I'm, and I'm blanking on, uh, on the name right now, um, Nick. Nick's got all those great 3D printers. And Chris was talking about ordering some 3D printers too. And I, I bought a 3D printer because my students had never heard or even seen a 3D printer at my, my new school that I'm teaching at this year. And so I, I got one and just so that I could open up that opportunity. But we don't have to have those in order to make STEM, in order to have STEM learning happening in our classroom. It's great, but it's really all about the real world 
and making education relevant. It's not a magic answer. STEM, PBL, STEAM, whatever you want to call it. And STEM and STEAM, basically the same thing. If you want to highlight that extra art aspect to it, um, that's great. Uh, but I, I think it's almost impossible. Like you take away the art aspect of STEM, uh, it's, it's impossible to separate the two. They almost, it almost breaks down. I mean, like I got this pine cone right here. I mean, there's tremendous uh, STEM to uh, how all this is arranged. In fact, it's got uh, Fibonacci sequence in it as well. Uh, but I tell you what, there is an art aspect to this pine cone right here. And you know what? That to me is, is shows it's impossible to separate the STEM, the STEAM, the art uh, from all those things. But it, none of it is a magic answer. But it's really all about um, trying to build creativity aside our curriculum, to build inspiration with our instruction, and, and to add in a whole lot more wonder where maybe all we're doing is, is having worksheets. And I can tell that probably a lot of you are probably already moving past a lot of just that straight curriculum and instruction and worksheet atmosphere. And you're creating uh, opportunities of creativity and inspiration and wonder for your kids. And you want to help find ways to help those other educators uh, in your schools, classrooms, communities uh, to be able to do that as well. Uh, it's not just activities and crafts. We have to be very careful about that. So many people think STEM, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this project. We're gonna, we're gonna make some straws and um, marshmallow towers and stack of note cards and all those kinds of things. And those are great. But if all we ever do is just make a project then we're failing kids. We are failing them by, by showing them it's really just arts and crafts time. It's not. We have to have curriculum based in our projects that we do with our kids and really turn it into authentic, a challenge. Um, a project is great because we almost like get a kid to replicate something. But if all they do is just replicate what we've told them to replicate, it's no different than giving them a worksheet where they have to fill in the blanks like we tell them to fill in the blanks. We want to get it to the point where it's just an authentic challenge that really makes every kid thinking of new ways, inventive ways, innovative ways to be able to connect uh, that STEM, that learning with the real world. So I said some interactive questions. Let's get our, uh, get our chat fingers going here. Why do you think, if you had to describe why kids like STEM so much, uh, and if you're watching the, the uh, recorded version of this, uh, I'll be sharing out some of the ideas that people are typing here in the chat box. Um, but kids definitely love STEM. If you say it's time for STEM kids, uh, they're excited. Um, so people are typing in the chat box right now. Doesn't have to be fancy answers. Doesn't have to be paragraphs. Just uh, I see hands-on activities, real world relevance, creative, wide open. It's naturally how they think. I love that, Deb. That's great. It's fun, says Sarah, with capital letters, F-U-N, yes. It is creativity, hands on. Youth brains crave puzzles and connections. Yes, Nick, right on. Explaining the world around them. Yes, they want to understand that the world that they live in, they want to be able to solve problems in the world they live in as well. Those are all great uh, examples of why kids love and so many more. They, they love making messes and things like that. Now, here's another question I always love asking. What is your favorite STEM movie? And there's a reason I ask this. Um, so if you got a favorite STEM movie, um, <laughs> a favorite scene, we even got the favorite scene of somebody already. It's one of my favorite scenes too, that, that, uh, that square filter to fit in the round hole, the Martian. And yeah, it's not PG, uh, but I know there is a, uh, a, a junior reader version of the Martian. The book is great too, um, but there are some clips. Again, you don't have to play the whole movie to get the point across in a class. You can just play a clip of something um, to really inspire some kids. Uh, anybody got any other movies that they're thinking of that are great STEM movies? I mean, I, I know tons of them. Apollo 13, yep, even before you saw the slide. Great movie, right. Uh, so many more. Um, and, and in fact, what that does is that kind of shows us that, that there is STEM all part interwoven into uh, the fabric of our entertainment, the fabric of, of everyday lives of the kids that we are teaching. Um, they see the wonder that happens in a movie like Wally -E or Big Hero 6 or Swiss Family Robinson, some old classics from the, from the way back. Oh, War Games. That's a good one, Sarah. I love that one. And in fact, um, I've, I've turned a bunch of those uh, movies. I've, you know, I've watched through them, found the best scenes, uh, listed the times, some ideas for some projects or connections um, from so many different movies. 
Uh, again, those are also on my website as well, free to download. And again, just to, uh, to share, <laughs> Hidden Figures, yes. In fact, Hidden Figures, even better books, so much more information. I've got a copy of it in my classroom. Actually, this is my second copy because first copy a kid uh, checked out right before spring break and they're like, Mr. Woods, can I borrow this book? I said, yes. And they're like, but I might lose it. I said, I don't care, I'll get another one. Um, that's the kind of things that we can do to, to inspire. Again, every kid, every classroom, every day. Yep, kids version of the, of the book as well. But let me talk just a little bit real quick about Big Hero 6 and connect that to some of the STEM uh, that we want to see happening, the STEM learning, that what we feel STEM learning can look like uh, in our classrooms. Because Big Hero 6 is this amazing uh, cast of characters, this very uh, dynamic uh, group of, of kids who love learning. And, and when the hero first goes into his his uh, brother's uh, lab, which is really like a STEM classroom, he's, he's amazed. He, he sees the wonder, the, the excitement of these things that these people have been creating. And, and he looks around and everybody's doing it. You know, I mean, that's the peer pressure we want to create. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's coming up with ideas. And to the point where he wants to be in this nerd lab. I want my classroom to be a nerd lab. I hope you want your classroom to be a nerd lab, a place where a kid can feel uh, confident enough uh, where they can, can take hold of that learning and make it their own. Now, how do we build that culture of STEM learning? Let's dive into some ways. Um, first of all, find the early adopters in your school. Some of you have, um, you are the early adopters. You're the ones that are gonna help transfer that to the other teachers in your school. Um, some of you uh, are gonna look for those early adopters and, and group together with them and pull them together and say, let's be the ones to, to really make STEM break out of just the STEM classroom or just the STEM time that we're doing where we walk down the hallway, go to STEM, walk back to our regular classrooms. Um, and then building confidence. How do we build confidence in our kids to, to be willing to try uh, new things? And I know a lot of us uh, deal with that every day and, and different kids are at different stages. Some kids are ready to try and some kids, it just takes a lot more pushing. Um, and, and, I, and I love the idea of the four C's, right? Creativity and, and uh, communication and collaboration and critical thinking. Well, those four C's build the two C's of curriculum and content that we really need to be building. Again, back to that idea that we can't just do projects and arts and crafts. We got to use those four C's that we talk about as 21st century skills. They're really learning skills to build those two C's of curriculum and content that we want happening in our classroom. It's the foundation that we build all those skills in our, in our kids. Now, other things, let's notice the STEM around you. There is STEM all around you. And I've, I've been pointing out some things. I would guess that a lot of you see the STEM uh, everywhere you go. When you are scrolling through a, uh, your whatever social media feed, are you looking at those videos that you come across and saying, hey, that would be a great one to show my students. Instead of just saying, that would be a great one to show my students, add it to a playlist. If you don't know how to make a YouTube playlist, it's super simple. If you got a Google account, it's easy to do. If you don't know how to do it, ask someone. I'm sure Chris could help you or I could explain it later on, but it's super simple. That way, when you've got five minutes or two minutes or three minutes at the beginning, end or middle of class, you can say, hey, let's watch this video. Hey, this would be a really great connection of STEM. Maybe it's about a career. Maybe it's uh, somebody making soap. Maybe it's uh, somebody that was the inventor of the Magalite. One of my favorite videos, uh, uh, Tony Maglia, uh, in, uh, immigrant from uh, Europe, and, and how he came to this country and created the Maglite basically in his shop. Uh, just simple things like that every day can, can show kids that STEM isn't just the, the projects that we do in a classroom or robots or rockets. It's really part of every day. And we see those things each and every day. We can share them with our kids. We see news stories every day that have great STEM connections. Now, um, during the pandemic, one, one of the best articles I read was about some girls on a robotics team in Afghanistan turning of uh, old car parts, windshield wiper motor and other parts into a ventilator. Just what an incredibly great story that would be to share with my students. And I shared with my students and there's stories like that each and every day. Like, like right now there's stories, I mean, it's not as good, but uh, there's stories about inflationary costs and, and things and prices of things going up. And, and for me as a math teacher, I mean, that's like a perfect example to get kids start thinking about um, exponential growth and decay and 
uh, connect into to different things that I'm doing in my math class, but whatever kind of things connect to uh, whatever you're doing in your classroom. There's news stories about them each and every day. I also make uh, about each week, sometimes every other week, depending if I got time or not, I make a weekly issue of the Daily STEM with news stories, um, simple ideas, um, challenges, mystery photos from under my microscope, all free. You can download them as PDFs and share them with your kids. Uh, they also get translated into Spanish and French. If you got if you got uh, other classrooms at your school that are are studying those languages, that's a great way to get uh, get kids uh, crossing those curricular bounds as well. Um, what's been in the news a lot lately? The Perseverance Rover. That's been a great opportunity to share little bits and things and updates each and every day. Uh, NASA's got great stuff, great content. If you haven't already, uh, Mark Rober, who many kids have watched videos of just scrolling through YouTube, uh, they can they can actually see Mark Rober going behind the scenes uh, talking about, and he, he uh, released that before uh, the Perseverance Rover landed uh, and just how, how cool that was uh, as well as see some of that behind the scenes. And NASA and SpaceX and so many of these different companies right now, great uh, resources, great stuff. You can sign up on uh, NASA to get on the STEM engagement. You can get a free weekly newsletter. They sell, send you resources and ideas. Uh, if you go to a fun, fun thing on SpaceX's website, if you've never seen it, if you click at the top menu, uh, you can actually see careers of all the different types of jobs that people do at SpaceX. Great eye-opening opportunity for your kids. But there's, you can watch launches live. I mean, it's incredible the things that we can do each day, every day in our classroom, little or no uh, cost. I play like when there's a, a, a spacewalk happening and they're working on the space station. I've got that playing just on the screen in the background while the kids are working. What a, what a simple thing. Or, or tell the kids, hey, watch this with your family at home. There's a launch happening this weekend. Um, it's, it's incredible. But use those questions that kids ask as well. If a kid asks a question like, hey, could we tile the floor with pennies? Because we were talking about uh, different shapes that fit together and tile together. How much would it cost to cover our floor with pennies? That was a great question that my students were able to even think about and consider when they were at home virtual learning this year. Because there's so many things that you can do um, based off of kids' questions. Use those questions that kids ask. And if you don't have time for that question right then, have the kids write it on the wall or have them write it down so that later on when there is time, you can tackle some of those uh, questions. And yeah, there's some uh, great resources uh, available. Uh, the Hub is a member of the NASA's Museums and Informal Educator Alliance, and they can partner to help bring some of those things to, uh, to your classrooms as well. That's awesome. Uh, thanks for, for noting that. Double stuff Oreos, are they double? Anybody want to guess in the chat box? I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, but once you ask the kids the question, or once they ask that question one day, and I went and grabbed some Oreos, and um, they measured. They measured the height. They weighed them. Uh, they checked volume. There's so many different ways to think about it. Um, but there's so many different uh, possibilities. Uh, in fact, there's even playlists of some YouTube videos of people separating the cream from the cookie. Uh, just some uh, incredible stuff. And if you're wondering how I did it in my classroom, uh, check out that playlist as well. Again, playlists, they're great. Um, share pictures. You know, when you're walking around, um, you pull out that phone out of your pocket and snap a picture. There's so many things. I share these pictures with my students all the time. Why are pancakes round? Um, what do you think uh, you notice about this tree? What kind of questions could you uh, come up with from this tree that got cut down? Why did it get cut down? Uh, how many years did it live? Uh, are all the rings different? Um, why do they cut it in half and then in half? Why is the center of the tree not in the center uh, of the tree? So many questions just from one simple picture that you share with your kids virtually, you share with your kids on the screen, when you're back in the classroom, whatever. Pictures can create all sorts of questions and STEM learning opportunities and opportunities for engagement. And sometimes it just happens when you just pull out a phone, snap a picture of something you see, and then you know what help else happens? Yeah, Beth, they, they are great. Um, cause then the kids start snapping pictures of stuff and they bring them in and they say, Hey, Mr. Woods, could you put this on the board and get kids to think about it? I love that. That's that to me is when it, when it makes it real. And I love snapping pictures of things that are like real story problems. Cause I'm a math teacher. I don't want those fake story problems. I want to help them realize that a story problem is all about helping them in real life. Like which bag of ice do you buy? Which one's cheaper? Or when we went to the pinball place the other night, it was one price for one hour. Uh, and then it was different price for two hours and it wasn't just an equal amount. So we had to decide and actually we could only stay an hour anyway because it was about to close. But again, those are the types of things you can bring into your classroom each and every day. It's not about the kits. STEM is really 
all about the kids. We want to focus on them, bring their interests and passions as much as we can into the classroom. If your kids love movies, did you know Pixar has all sorts of stuff, shows behind the scenes, how they make the movies, how they create the, the, the lighting, how they create the stories. So you can bring in that literacy aspect, how they create all the crowds of robots in, in WALL-E. Um, all sorts of great resources. Just search for Pixar in a box, you'll find it, or there's the link in the, in the slides as well. It's part of the Khan Academy uh, website. Your kids love Legos. Find a way to bring those into the classroom. You can use them for stop motion scenery. You can use them uh, for quick challenges or maze. You know, put like 10 Legos on their desk and say, you know, how many different things could you create out of this? Or use them as patterns. Use the different ones for coding, getting them thinking just differently. Pretty soon they're going to start realizing that we can use the things, the resources that we have in multiple different ways. Kind of going back to that Apollo 13 idea, right? You can use whatever you've got in different ways. Uh, games. You know, we, we think about games as something you just play at home, but there's so many great ways that you can use games in a classroom to help uh, more learning happen and more excitement and wonder. Yeah, from the coding games like, you know, Scratch and Code.org and all those different types uh, to, to games where your card games. And, and instead of just playing, uh, if you've ever played War, where everybody, both people flip over a card uh, and this whoever gets the bigger one wins, uh, turn them over and, and then multiply them or add them together. Or somebody taught me recently about this game, three people play it, uh, two people put a card, uh, they flip a card up and put it on their forehead so they can't see their own, but they can see the other number. And then the third person can see both of them and they tell them what those two numbers add up to. And then now these two people have to figure out, okay, what is my card? Because the other card is seven and they said 10, that means minus three. And so it's like backwards figuring it out. So many, so many different things that you can do, or you can have kids make their own games, especially if they're at home right now and they got broken games and, and leftover pieces. Get those kids creating games. There's so many uh, different cross-curricular things you can do if you have never had your kids uh, making games. And those of you that are 3D printing, I'm guessing that you've tried uh, having your kids make some games or make some game pieces or making the dice. And don't just get them to make a six-sided dice, get them to make all different types of, of shapes and sizes of dice. Um, so many great connections we could do. And then look for those great YouTube channels. And some of your kids might be some of the, um, the ones that point out some of these to you. If you've never seen Joseph's Machines YouTube channel, it's incredible. He makes all sorts of like Rube Goldberg type machines and, and they're a lot of fun. And these are a lot of short ones and some of them he shows how he makes them. And, and, and again, there's so many resources like that available out there for us to use. Uh, and, and when you find those things, share them with the teachers at your school, share them with those others around you, especially if you are one of those people that is those early adopters of STEM. Interests, kids have lots of interests um, and we wanna to try to connect those with STEM as well. If you've ever checked out Ever5 free resources, they've got a lot of great ones um, that, that connect um, interests. If, if, uh, I, I know hockey is, is, is big uh, on, the, on the West Coast out there. Uh, there Everfi has some uh, connections uh, with, with sports and STEM, with hockey and STEM, if you've never checked that out. Um, but there's, again, so many other uh, great resources all available out there. Um, it's just, just incredible. If your kids like horses, there's horse lovers math. There, there's, I mean, it's just limitless. Uh, all we have to do is look around and we start finding things. Like if kids like Minecraft, which so many kids do, um, they can recreate history. A, a, a local uh, national park service uh, near where I used to live is, is having people recreate the buildings from 1930 in the town, recreating them in Minecraft. What, a, what an incredible resource it is for the national park service. And at the same time, it's an incredible learning opportunity for those people that are involved with that. There's so many different things out there when we start to realize that we can just make do with what we've got. We can use those resources that are around us. Stop waiting to get that grant. Grants are great. Getting those resources is good. Um, and, and I love it that, that the STEM hub there and CTE hub is, is providing so many of those great resources, but you can't just say we can't do things because we don't have the resources. Those kids deserve uh, the things that we can do with them each and every day. Again, don't forget to keep throwing some questions or asking some more questions. And I'm going to keep firing now through a whole bunch of resources uh, and gives us some time for some Q&A at the end. And I know some of you are on lunchtime, so people, some of you might be popping in and popping out as well. Um, but keep on, keep on thinking about stuff. Uh, paper, don't forget paper is one of the best 
uh, resources, paper and cardboard, have all those types of paper available. If you got blue paper and white crayons and, and pencils that nobody ever uses the white crayons and colored pencils, uh, let the kids create some uh, blueprints. Uh, it's just real simple. Um, just a simple little idea, especially for some younger kids. They might feel like they're uh, really grown up. If you're looking for some simple ideas of, of making paper airplanes, if you've never checked out foldandfly.com, I had a kid making a paper airplane because kids, they get their assignment and they love to fold that assignment up into a paper airplane. So what's the first thing I do every time I see a kid doing that? I love sharing that website with them. And all of a sudden they realize I can make more paper airplanes. Yeah, and I'll let you make more paper airplanes. Um, and there's also things you can 3D print uh, to go on those paper airplanes too. Uh, or launchers and things like that. Isometric drawings, if you've never tried that, it's, it's dot paper and it helps you to draw almost three-dimensionally. Uh, it's a great simple thing. I love keeping that paper in my classroom for kids at any time to just kind of draw and sketch. It's a lot like low-tech Minecraft, uh, but it's also great to help kids to think virtually and, and visually uh, into three dimensions. And for a lot of kids who are, are trying to build something, it helps them to draw things uh, three-dimensionally or think of the three uh, views, the orthographic views, if you know what that means. Uh, but again, there's so many things like that uh, out there. And once those kids uh, get the taste of it, they love to expand and try uh, some of these things all on their own, just for more fun. Um, cardboard. Cardboard is the simplest uh, right now, most uh, universally found uh, resource that we can use in a STEM classroom or for STEM learning. Um, and if you've never uh, thought about the fact that there's thick cardboard and thin cardboard, the corrugated versus like the stuff that um, maybe is your like a KFC box or a cereal box, um, things like that, that's differences that, that can help a, a younger kid uh, or make some more curvy type stuff with a thinner kind of cardboard versus that thicker stuff, which, which requires a little bit more uh, thought process of how you're putting it together. Uh, if you've never seen the make-do screws, that's those little blue pieces here. Those are incredible uh, resource um, that um, that are reusable. So if you're running out of tape all the time or hot glue, uh, they're great. There's also another resource called Three Ducks, and Chris can tell you about those two as well if you haven't heard of them already. Um, but but again, it's it's one of those free resources. Use it. Uh, get kids designing things for pets. Uh, get kids designing anything. If they're at home, there's so many things that they can do uh, with the cardboard that they've got uh, to, to visualize, to create, to create their own cereal box, to create uh, their own uh, inventions and ideas. Uh, if you need some other great ideas for creating with um, cardboard and paper, um, we get STEM cats. <laughs> I love that. Uh, somebody threw that in the chat box. I just, I, that, sorry, I guess that was the... Uh, Every, everything on the internet has to have a cat in it. So there, there's, our, there's our cat. Okay, um, DarylWakelum.com. Uh, he's got some great things that he's doing. He's out of the UK and he makes some incredible stuff out of cardboard and recyclables. Definitely check that out or share that with some other teachers at your school. Incredible, incredible uh, resource. Rob Ives, same one, but his, uh, his area of expertise is to make things that move, fold, bend, um, move up and down because of pulleys and things like that. Check that out if you got some uh, kids interested in taking some of that learning to a next step. And for some of you that are, you know, more CTE and STEM and upper level, uh, they can start out with a cardboard version prototype and move into uh, mechanical with wood or, or 3D printed parts uh, as well. And if you need some simple ideas for how to get things to connect together without tape or glue or anything like that, Aaron Riley's got some uh, these, these great resources, uh, a lot of teachers print these out, put them up on the wall just to remind kids, or some people actually have the kids create them, all these ways of slots and flaps uh, to make things, and then have them displayed on the wall to remind kids, you don't just need a pile of duct tape to get things uh, to connect together and to create. Uh, one of the great things that I've done with paper and cardboard in the past, uh, I had my students start out by tracing their shoes, and what did the kids say? Because that was art. I mean, that was that was us trying to talk about area and perimeter. All the kids said, "Well, could we make some shoes?" Well, definitely. Let's let's try making some shoes. So I opened up the cabinets, and the kids started making shoes. And every year since then, uh, we've had a shoe design challenge where I let the kids uh, design and come up with some uh, shoes, and they have to draw them 2D. You know, all the different views, and and think about how these things go together. I show them videos of of how shoe companies uh, create shoes um, and, and, and all the processes that go into the design work and kids love those realistic connections. And, and then they love the, the opportunity to, to make surface area and volume 
uh, come to life. Uh, and if you're wondering what other types of supplies besides paper and cardboard, here's a great list from JC Maslick. Uh, also a great follow on Twitter, and she does a lot of blogging and stuff as well. Just a quick, simple uh, list for anybody wondering what kind of things do we need? Uh, what kind of things would be great for our kids to, uh, to, to have, uh, especially your kids at home? They can take a box and fill up whatever kinds of things they can find on this list. And, and, and then now they've got their own STEM box, their own maker box that they can create with, even though they're at home, maybe without some supplies or on the weekends or in the summer, get those kids to keep on uh, creating uh, as well. And if you don't have supplies and you want to do stuff virtually, there's so many simulations websites as well. There's, did you know there's a simulator for Spirograph that you used when you were a kid or uh, different gear generators um, or the Bebot simulator, which if you're a little kid teacher, uh, the, those Bebots are so great, but all, Azobot also just released and I haven't even updated it yet uh, on, my, on my website, but I got a whole bunch of these links of things that are virtual that you can use uh, and, and Ozobot created a, um, a simulator for their, their robots as well. Again, so we can have some of those things that kids can do no matter where, because we're gonna look for those ideas. We're gonna copy those ideas. The teachers at your school who haven't dove really into the STEM stuff yet, they're gonna just copy an idea and that's great. And we wanna encourage them to move on to the point where they can then change those ideas and then create their own ideas. And that's just a, a simple copy, change, create, a uh, great way to think about what we can do in our classroom to really uh, make that STEM learning happen as we, as we grow alongside uh, the kids. Every STEM learning situation is different. Whatever you've got, you got to use it with your kids. Uh, if you've got water bottle fillers in your school, those are incredible for collecting data, uh, tracking that every day or every hour during the day. Uh, if you've got plants growing in your classroom, have the kids measure those, track the weather, track the sports scores of their favorite team, track their high scores in their favorite video games that they love playing. Real data is always better than fake data. Um, here's some of the plants that my students have grown uh, in the past. And um, uh, we take a water bottle and we just cut off the top and put some dirt in there and put a seed in there. If you put the seed on the side, you see the roots grow down, you can see the plant grow up. Again, measurements, all those types of things. And so many kids have never grown stuff. What a uh, tremendous opportunity. A simple thing you can do also helps the kids to think about uh, repurposing uh, things around them. Uh, I'm going to try to bust through a few more quick ideas here, but uh, we're definitely going to have some, some question and answer time. I want to show uh, a couple more ideas, and there's going to be a whole lot more that you can go through these, these slides too on your own and, and kind of keep going through. Uh, if you've ever noticed litter out there, uh, litter that's like on the side of the road or litter near your school or litter on the streets, uh, in your communities and neighborhoods. Uh, I love using the Literati app. I've helped over the past year make some, some lesson plans for them. It's basically an app that you snap a picture um, using your phone of the litter, you pick it up. And of course the, the phone tags the geolocation of that litter. And then you can tag what type of litter that is. You could say, oh, it's a, it's a, a paper cup. It's a plastic bottle. It's, it's Marlboro, it's whatever product it is. Uh, and then you kids can see the impact of that. You can even create a challenge uh, for your kids and, and in a local community and within a certain radius after you make a free account and you can, you can have your kids uh, all add and join uh, their data to that challenge. And they start to see all of us together can make some, some great impact um, by, by just all of us picking up some, some litter when we go for a walk with our parents or our family or when we're at the park or wherever. Uh, or you can take the kids around the school and, and all those lessons, oh, let me go back to that, all those lessons that, uh, that, that I created have next step ideas where you, where you say, okay, we picked up the litter, now what? Could we redesign a product? Could we redesign packaging? Could we um, let somebody know that, that there would be a great spot right here for recycling bin or some trash cans? Would this be a, uh, something that we could talk to some of the local businesses and, and help them to rethink some of the uh, packaging and, and materials that they're giving out? So there's all those next steps that happen just from a simple uh, first step of picking up some litter. TED Ed, if you've heard of TED videos, uh, TED Ed videos are a great resource. You can even create lessons and look at already created lessons. Um, Earth Echo, if you've got uh, nature and, and water uh, sheds and, um, and different uh, biomes in your, in your community, they have some great resources and challenges and free stuff that they uh, provide as well. Uh, if you're looking for other free stuff and you're wondering, uh, make, a, make your own posters. You take, a, you take a famous quote by someone 
and make your own poster for your classroom. If you got that ability to print it out, have the kids create the posters instead of just putting up those same posters you put up every year. Again, that's how you build that STEM culture in your classroom. There's some free posters also. Uh, if you've ever had the kids read Rosie Revere books or NASA has some terrific uh, downloadable uh, posters as well. I saw some in the background too on, on Chris, uh, Chris and um, Sarah's uh, backgrounds. Uh, they've got some uh, free posters I've seen around as well. If you've never used Tinkercad, and I think a lot of you have because I think a lot of you have done some 3D printing. Uh, my students had never seen the 3D printer, so I just started them off just trying to make some things in Tinkercad. I said, make something amazing, make something creative, and, and they did. And then before we knew it, they were uh, now creating things and asking me to make things, and could we make this? And um, we made some cookie cutters and, and now they're making uh, the name plates for in the teacher's office, uh, the office, all the, the shelves where the, the teachers get their mailbox stuff and slots didn't have any names on it. They were just like post-it notes, sticky notes. So we're creating those uh, plates right now uh, just, just from these kids, just trying it and working with it. If you've never tried Tinkercad, that's the simplest, easiest way for kids to create, uh, to be able to use that for 3D printing. Um, Instructables, great site. If you've never checked out Instructables, it's step-by-step -step how to make things. There's even a teacher section and you can even just search on there for paper airplane launcher or origami or uh, leather work or all the different types of things. Great resource for how to uh, make things. If you wanna make Rube Goldberg machines with your kids, check out rubegoldberg.com. Uh, you, can, you can actually join competitions. Kids love making Rube Goldberg machines. I don't know why, but I know why because I would like to make Rube Goldberg machines too. Uh, but if we really go back to that, what's most important in education, it's all about the kids. And, and more than anything, more than all these ideas and more than any other ideas, I could give you a thousand more ideas. It's all about the kids. What we can do to help those kids in your classroom get excited, use their interests, leverage their passions, get them excited about learning. That's what's going to, to help build uh, that culture uh, in our classroom. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead here uh, there are more resources, some great, that's a great book about uh, STEM careers and, and women in STEM. That's a great magazine. Uh, it's, you know, of course, magazines and books have some subscription costs and too. Uh, DC Comics just released a science-based comic book uh, with Flash and so many others, including Batman uh, 3D printing is one of the chapters for those of you uh, interested in that. Uh, every classroom should have a classroom library, even my high school math, room, math classroom, like I told you, hidden figures and such. If your kids like drawing, Jarrett Lerner is a great website for that. Uh, if your kids love music, OK Go Sandbox shows the mu how OK Go makes all their incredible music videos. Chrome has a music lab. If you've never checked that out, get your kids designing with that. Uh, STEM can be connected to history. If you are on Twitter, Magistra Roy, she is a Latin teacher that turned into a Roman technology teacher. And she's got her kids making all sorts of incredible, amazing stuff. And again, it's a great reminder that every teacher can be an art teacher and a history teacher and a literacy teacher and a STEM teacher. We are all, all about trying to help uh, those kids in our classroom. We wanna make everywhere a classroom, get our parents uh, and families doing STEM with their kids, looking for those STEM shows that we can watch uh, wherever we are. These are some great, I mean, obviously Phineas and Ferb is one of the best STEM shows ever, uh, but if you didn't see it last, uh, last summer, it came out on Disney Plus Shop Class. Tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, show with uh, some great STEM and making happening. I am <coughs> just about out of breath here. Uh, we are definitely heroes, um, but I want to get to the point of some questions. All right, and we can, I can always share more ideas, but I would love to, uh, to hear uh, some of the questions that some of you have. Um, again, I've been, I'm, I'm out of breath. I need to take a drink, I think. How about that? Is that all right, Sarah? Yes, please do. Wow, so many fabulous ideas and great inspirations. And while you go ahead and catch your breath and, and hydrate everyone, um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and go ahead and share your camera, you can jump in with questions. You can put them in the chat while you're getting ready to do that. Um, I wanted to ask you, Chris, um, so one of you know the premises here is, of course, finding kids their interests and their passions. Um, and, and getting them to, you know, to be curious, um, and ask questions and solve problems. So my question to you is how do we teach kids to ask those great questions? Yeah, to get, uh, to get kids asking those questions, uh, so, so important. Um, 
I, th I think part of it comes from modeling it with our own kids. I mean, the moment that we start, we start asking questions and showing kids that we want to learn things. Uh, so many times when we're having a conversation in class, kids will say something random and I'll say, oh, that's a good question. I wonder. And so I, I hop right to Google and I start typing it in and, and, and I'm demonstrating that growth mindset right with my kids right there happening. I mean, I'm, I've got Google and Google Images bookmarked right along my top tab right there. So we can quick pop to that anytime. I mean, but that, I mean, to me, that's always the first place to start. If you're demonstrating those questions, um, and then again, bringing those, some of those things in as well. Uh, I love that question though by Robert here. How do you assess some of those open-ended questions? And, and then again, also that convincing stakeholders. Um, so to me, I've always had the belief that if we get through, if we get through 70% of the content and curriculum in my classroom, but those kids have a firm grasp on that 70%, that's better than getting through 100% of the curriculum and the kids don't remember any of it and none of it connected with them on a personal level. Um, I think I think the kids are going to be way more prepared uh, based on that. Um, I, I, I know that's kind of a, you know that doesn't that doesn't get everybody excited when they hear that, um, but that that to me is what I've seen for for years of, of teaching kids that struggle with math. I've 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 never taught like the advanced classes of math. I've always taught the kids that that struggle, the kids that uh, don't like math. Uh, I always had a, a hands-on geometry class that I taught. Those shoes that those kids were making was from a, a hands-on remedial level uh, geometry class. And they did it. And you know what? At first it was like, yeah, we're taking a few days. We could be doing something else. We could be learning something else. But I tell you what, when we got to surface area and volume later on in the year, those kids rocked that stuff way better because they visualized and could see things two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally way better than um, the kids that, um, you know, if we just didn't do that, if we only just talked about it on a picture on a, on, a, on a worksheet and things like that. Yeah. Bringing parents into the conversation. Yeah, got to get parents. You know what? And, and I think a lot of parents, uh, great question, Sarah. Uh, if, if we get parents just trying some simple things, you know, like those lists that I have um, of just 77 ideas, you know, and that's, it just makes it simple and accessible for parents who, who may not feel confident. Because, because if a parent doesn't feel confident, if they think that STEM has to be 3D printers and robots and rocket science, um, they're, they're not going to do it with their kids. But, but they've been taught to read to their kids, right? They know that it's important to, to help their kids read, whether they do it or not. I mean, that, that still goes down to the parents. But if they, if they say, hey, let's go for a walk and pick up litter and, and do that together, now it's a great learning opportunity. Or, hey, while we're on our walk, let's look at, at how many different types of birds we see, how many types of trees do we see? Let's bring back some of the leaves and, and turn them into something. Um, no matter what level that you're working with your kids, like I taught my daughter, well, I didn't teach her, I helped her. I stood next to her while she changed the battery uh, in, in, in our vehicle because the battery went dead when she was driving. And so she learned that confidence um, just from me standing there helping her. I held the flashlight, she did the work, um, but that's where we can multiply that STEM learning when it happens outside of school. And hopefully our kids are gonna get excited about it and, and give the parents questions, give the parents ideas that they can ask in, in your normal um, communication letters with parents and your school um, accounts and things like that. Give them some questions to ask around the dinner table or um, give them some ideas. Hey, here's five things you could try with your kids this week. Here's, you know, or print out that list and put it on your fridge and, and pick an idea when the kids say we're bored, you know, get parents playing games with their kids, get the, get the parents to put down their phones. I have to do that too. I have to put my phone down and, and you know, spend time with my own kids because that's so important. Those kids are, those kids are going to grow up so fast. I mean, they, they do. Um, and I see also um, just, just how important that is every time we do something like that with our kids. Hopefully that kind of answers that question, Sarah. Yeah, that's, that's great. I'm going to go ahead and give everyone a little bit of wait time here for other questions. I've got a whole list here for you, though, too. If, if someone else wants to jump in, please, please don't be shy. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody want to throw a question? Unmute or type it? Up to you. Yeah, hop in. Ace, please do. I can't unmute. Uh-oh. Says ask to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I forgot to change my name on here. My name is Marcus, but it's like that's it for me. Uh, anyways, um, I was wondering for like the 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 shoes that you created with your your kiddos in your classroom. Um, 
like how like how can you like approach that if you're just looking at that as like a pure like exploration mode or tinkering mode um like what kind of prompting or what kind of like supposition could you give to to the kiddos to get them to engage in something where it's like we're going to create shoes um and letting them go from there or like in another kind of way of like yeah. kind of like you were saying earlier of like giving them a picture or giving them like a loose idea and then going from there versus like having um like a like a curriculum foundation to it but just looking at it just purely as like a player exploration yeah exactly great question because because i think you know i mean we we know for a lot of the things that we do with our kids like once they get started in it they're going to be excited about it and they're they're going to they're going to they're going to grasp on it most you know at least most of them and, and every kid is going to find some different way to create some sort of shoe that has some excitement level yeah, for them maybe it's a flip-flop maybe it's maybe it's a shoe that that helps uh, a grandparent uh, that, that can't bend down to tie their shoes, you know, like, like Nike just released in the past year, they showed a, a video. And isn't Nike in Oregon anyway? I mean, yes, sir. <laughs> that should, that should be the simplest connection. Um, <laughs> but, um, but they, they showed off that, that one shoe where you basically like step into it. And as you step into it, it, it bends down and folds together. I, I, I'm blanking on the name of what that, that, uh, that shoe is called, but uh, I shared that video with my students uh, right, you know, like the next day after I saw that, because because those videos like that can spark an interest. And then you can say, okay, so how do they design shoes? And then you show maybe, you, you know, you search YouTube for, you know, like uh, shoe designer and there's, you know, every, every company wants to show off all the cool shoes they're making and the, and the cool athletes and stuff that help design those shoes. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden now kids realize that, hey, maybe it's not the athletes that are really cool. Maybe it's the people that are actually designing the shoes that are really cool that I want to be like. And that's the kind of career uh, that I would love to have. And, and, and I just like that project because a, it was a great connection for, for my geometry kids. Um, but, but for any classroom, it's, it's great because it's, it's helping kids to be able to visualize things someday. They'll be better at putting their Ikea furniture together because they can visualize 2d and 3d. Um, but, it, but it helps them to think about product design, helps them to think about even just the fact that that shoe that they're wearing, um, how did it get put together? How did it get designed? How was it designed for comfort? How did it, you know, did you ever think about the fact that your shoe size is somebody's uh, different than somebody else's shoe size? And how do they replicate that, that uh, all those colors and pieces? Do they, have to cut, do they have to cut individual pieces for size seven shoes versus size eight shoes, the logos that they put on them? Are they different sizes? And, and all of a sudden now kids start thinking about um, different things like that. So um, honestly, best way to start, have the kids look at their own shoes, have the kids trace their shoes, watch a video. A lot of times that's the best way to start, get kids thinking, um, about something right there uh, in their in their own. Um, how can you take? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people and, and other people. If you search that hashtag shoe design challenge, because other people have done it since I've done it. Uh, there was one uh, one school that did it as a um, uh, as a fundraiser. They raffle. They had people bid on on the paper cardboard shoes that the kids made, and then they took that money and donated it to. Uh, uh, an international organization that was uh, giving shoes to kids in another in another country. Um, so you can also do that. And, and other people have done it where they had kids add light up LED things right to, uh, to, to shoes, just using those simple electronics uh, ideas as well. So, I mean, there's all different types of ways you can take it just from a simple project. And again, that's what it's all about. Just making relevant stuff from out there in those kids' worlds in, happen uh, in our classroom, no matter, no matter who we are, whether we're running the STEM lab or whether we're whatever. So, um, that's cool. Yeah, I know we're at time too. So, I know, <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I can't I can't encourage people enough. You know, you're the early adopter. You're the ones that are passionate enough to join this uh, today during your lunch period or whatever. Um, you be that person at your school that helps uh, get everybody else excited, engaged, and share those ideas. And if you ever come across and you're like, "Hey, a teacher's asked looking for this idea or that idea," ask me. I'm, I'm I can I can help you find that idea. Um, I've, I've done it a thousand times. So. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much. Those of you that have to hop off, we certainly understand. Um, those of you that still have another question you'd like to ask Chris directly, go ahead and uh, throw it out there. We want to thank everyone who was able to join us today. We want to thank you, Chris. You're a real inspiration for us and our hub. And um, thank you for your time today, sharing all these great resources and all this passion and enthusiasm. Yeah, always, always happy to help. So, yeah, and, and, well, yeah I'm, I'm, I can 